Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Today we're talking about perspectives on energy uh, with Guillermo Sabatier, joins us from Virginia. And today we're going to talk about big oil, uh, the big oil climate lawsuits and the fact that they may be moving forward because uh, the Supreme Court has shown interest in hearing those cases. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting moment for oil and for um, consumers. Welcome to the show, Guillermo. Jay, thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been over a month right, since we last had a show together, so it's definitely had good to be back and always very grateful to be invited back. So. <laughs> we are happy to have you. So, Guillermo, what is happening? I must say, I was I was not really tracking on this 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 series of cases, and they're from all around the country, and they they could have a huge moment in terms of oil and the oil companies and the mm -hmm. economy for that matter. I have been tracking some of these cases. They've been going for going on for a few years. There was California had had a had a case on climate change and due to negligence and from, from the from the fossil fuel industry. Chicago, uh, individual cities, Illinois had another case, and they've been going on for about three to four years already. And you know these these cases are being fought at the at the local or state level, maybe even at the circuit uh, circuit level, right? And when when it escalates to some kind of federal court system. But um, as you can imagine, right, different areas have different jurisdictions. I think the case with Hawaii, for example, and even Alaska, is that there's no interstate commerce with electricity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, where Hawaii may have had a better shot compared to the other states. Because once you get across those, once those electrons go across those state lines, that becomes a federal issue, among other things. Right? I mean, look, I'm not a legal expert. I know energy. I know energy policy. I know some of the science behind this. You know, I'm not the best engineer in the world, but I think I do okay. And uh, when I see policy being impacted, right, by by activism is one thing. But now, now you know, we're taking the uh, the uh, litigation approach, right, uh, and the courts and the, through the, the judicial system. Uh, I often wonder what is the what is the overall objective of these different lawsuits, and I'm sure every city has a different objective. Uh, so they may not all be putting in the same direction. Yeah, that's true. And there are several cities involved. There are several oil companies involved, and the and the defendants in these uh, various suits are not always the same. They're right. a big oil, is what they are. Right. Um, but what I, what I find interesting is um, this is sort of like tobacco, isn't it? Um, these right. guys are alleging that in, in tobacco, the tobacco companies knew there was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't say anything, kept on marketing. Um, and that's pretty much the kind of claim that's being made in these suits, um, that the oil companies knew that this was going to have a bad effect on climate change, that the U.S. is center, you know, in the, at the center of the climate change problem. Um, and the oil company didn't do anything to ameliorate the problem. That's a bit of a reach, actually, when you think about the yeah. fact that the U.S. is only one country in the world. And um, on the other hand, well, those all those oil companies are multinational, aren't they? Right. right. So they're dealing with more than oil from just here. For example, we had a show a few days ago about about the oil from Canada. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, what about these lawsuits? Do they affect you know oil from Canada? Well, they do, because you can make the same claim against a multinational corporation that's selling oil, mm -hmm. whether the oil comes from Indonesia, Canada, or anywhere else in the world. Um, so this is going to have a global effect, even though it seems like a national problem. Those lawsuits are not are not isolated to just they're not limited to just the U.S. There's a bunch of other individual countries suing in inter inter international court as well for the impact it's having on their on their particular economies and climates in, in their own nations. Right. So that's going to be an interesting thing to look at as well, because now you have a Supreme Court maybe taking a look at it. But what's going to happen if you go to the to the uh, some kind of international court? So that'll be interesting. Well, at the same time, right, you have governments that are not going to care, won't be effective. They're going to keep going full steam ahead, like China, for example, and Latin America and other countries that are just they're drilling. And they're also building a lot of new, not just oil, there's oil, there's fossil fuels. It's a separate lawsuit. And then there's oil by itself. And then that may include natural gas, that may include coal, that may include the whole North Sands in Canada, and a few other challenges in that, in that regard, right? So then what do you do with this transition fuel that everybody's trying to use to move over away from oil, you know, the dirtier fuels? Is that going to be impacted as well? 
And is that going to be, because right now natural gas is at an all time low in price. I mean, in some places it even competes with nuclear. It's even less expensive than coal in some markets. Whereas I remember, I think it's like down to $2.80, you know, for the M, uh, MMBTU. Whereas it, I remember at one point it was 16 to $18, the MMBTU, where it was cheaper to burn oil than it was to burn gas. So that's shifted dramatically. So is that going to be impacted as well? So what's that going to do? So I, I always wonder what, what the overall objective is. Is it just a short term, you know, very, very tunnel vision view of like, I want to get my money? Or is it something, I, am I trying to, you know, activate some kind of some kind of climate justice change in a legal system or am I trying to do something else? And that's where I've always had that concern, right? Where it's like, what is what is the goal here? Who is driving this? Well, there's a there's a the the first time it appeared in the Honolulu advertiser, or at least from from Hawaii, was uh, in this um this article about a guy who had a shipyard. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was close to the water level and uh, the, the, he was having sea level rise and his shipyard was being inundated on a regular basis. And th that's been creeping up for a while, but he was he was saying he can't do business this way. Um, and of course, you could make the same case for a lot of places, a lot of businesses in Hawaii, because they're close to the water line. And in fact, mm -hmm. the water level is creeping up. Um, and we have, you know, scientific data on that from the University of Hawaii about exactly how much uh, how much uh, sea level has risen and how mm -hmm. how much will rise over a period of time. So he's saying my business is gone. I want compensation. And that's he's probably not interested in saving the world. He's interested right. in compensation for his business. On the other hand, the city's involved and they're interested in the cost that it will take to fix uh, the roadways and the infrastructure that are going to get inundated over time and maybe soon. And and then you have the activists involved. and um, Undoubtedly, they support this. You're probably going to have more lawsuits in blue states than red states. That's what uh, I mean. And then you have a very interesting combination of people on the other side. Some of them say, we're really terrified. The oil companies are terrified about state suits. Because mm -hmm. state suits, the juries could get really run away and they right. could award billions every time. Um, <clears throat> that's a problem. Um, and then we're, uh, we prefer federal because we think we can get to the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, and we think the Supreme Court is, is slightly politicized. And I say slightly, slightly politicized. And when they rule on this, they may say, hey, this is a question for Congress. And right. Congress exactly. is probably not going to do anything because Congress is, you know, in turmoil. Mm. So, you know, what, what I get is there's a million factors here. What is interesting, very interesting, I hope you're sitting down for this, Guillermo. <clears throat> Alito has recused himself from this case. Right, right, right. He has a lot of stock and he probably has property in some places that it's going, you know, it brings into it a conflict of interest, right? And uh, it ju it's just like the same thing, right? Where, for example, just, just last week, the question was brought up, well, you know, if you're a judge who's a gun owner, should you be allowed to trial, you know, to to preside over a court that has to do with those rights? Well, it's the same, same thing holds here. Well, can you, can you be, it's different because owning a piece of hardware that, that's affected by the law is so not the same as owning, for example, millions of dollars of shares, that that could be you know, potentially impacted by this decision. So yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. It's it's it, if he's already moving in that direction, you know, it's going to be a good chance they're going to take take up this case. Also wondering, right? Because they, there is definite like impact as far as like just revenue from tourism alone, from real estate, all of that is impacted, right, in one way or another. So so that's then you have that group that group of a plane that's trying to recover like damages. <laughs> <laughs> well, the industry is, you know, uh, this has come to roost. This is an issue which I guess we knew would, you know, would, would start focusing as climate change got worse. And it is getting worse. I mean, I, I don't think the media adequately reports the fact that it's getting worse. And you see there are more fires, more floods and more extreme weather. It's all this is going to be a hot summer. And mm -hmm. people are going to die because they're already dying because of the heat. So climate change is happening. And uh, <clears throat> this is an example mm -hmm. of how climate change uh, through this legal contention mm -hmm. will affect everything. I mean, for example, 
it's going to affect the car industry. Just a few mm -hmm. days ago, we did a program on what cars mean to the average person right. in Hawaii and by extension to the average person in the U.S. and by extension to the average person in the world. Cars are really important. And most of them, sorry to say, are still petroleum cars. Mm -hmm. And that's likely to stay the same unless the government makes profound changes. So and then you get the oil companies, which are a huge industry, a huge capital concentration. And as I mentioned, they're, they're in multinational. Um, and they are going to have to change. If, they, if this gets to court, they're going to have to change. And while they change, um, my concern would be is the price of gas is going to go up. Not just gas, it's everything else. That's, yes. That, that, the, the impacts, right? The, the impact of that will be will have ripples everywhere. It just won't be, it'll be transportation in general. And even if that spurred along the whole, that transition and accelerated that transition of transportation from from, from uh, oil-based to just gas and fuel to something battery-based, right? I don't think we have the resources to available to even make that transition where it comes to battery materials, raw materials. And then even if that, if that was successful, getting to the point where uh, the infrastructure cannot handle uh, one or two electric cars in every household. It, it, it's just a matter of having everybody running their dryers. And, I, and I'm talking about a gas, you know, 220 volt dryer at a 30, 40 amp circuit. Cause when you, I mean, we have to install one here we, and it's like a 50 amp circuit, right? And, and not everybody has that available, even though a lot of utilities right now are trying to get, get ahead of it by giving you the charger, giving you the, 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 the labor, giving you the permitting, and giving you unlimited off-peak charging for a highly subsidized cost, right? I think Florida, uh, one of the utilities in Florida is doing that whole thing for just $36 a month for a 10-year commitment. And they even went as far as saying, well, even if you have a, a charger that's not, you know, not through their program, they'll get you on that unlimited charging. So they're trying to get ahead of it. But the problem is they're, they're, the, the infrastructure is not there. Uh, I think, I mean, given the pace of how these things move, I think about four to five years is where we might see something. I don't think this would be a total win for the oil company. I think they're going to have some collateral damage, but I also don't think it'll be a total loss, right? It, I mean, I don't think the plaintiffs are going to get everything they're looking for. It's going to be a slightly reduced settlement and some kind of compromise. Because this this court has shown that 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 it has it has some level of reasonable reasonableness in some regards, right, versus others. But it's really a toss up because it's kind of harder to to, to really predict what this this current scotus will do. And the harder they may kick it back down to one of the lower uh, uh, lower federal courts. And we'll see we'll see where that lands. Well, you know, it's interesting that um, the, the, the tip off as of the, the Times article a few days ago, the court went out to the Department of Justice and asked them for their opinion mm -hmm. on whether this was within the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which is right. really interesting. Um, so, you don't know, maybe they did that as a way to sort of defer the whole thing or or uh, find a trap door to get away from it. Um, uh, maybe they'll have to abide by whatever the Department of Justice says, uh, which will be interesting. Then they, then they got to take the case. And when they take the case, they're going to have guys like Leonard Leo, who is mm -hmm. clearly you know, on the side of the oil companies, uh, trying to influence the judges, which are not beyond a certain level of corruption on this. After all, the, um, the stakes are huge. I would say it's not billions, it's trillions. That's right. what we're talking about here. Um, so you and I should discuss the two sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. One is to get to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has shown a certain level of interest. They take cert on this, they, 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 and, they, and they rule. And they rule in favor of letting the states continue well, to accept awesome. these cases, in which case there will be huge billion-dollar judgments mm -hmm. all over the country against the oil companies. What happens to energy in general? What happens to the utility companies? That's what you study. Well, I think everything will go up. And, I mean, the cost the cost of it will, and I'm thinking of an extreme way, right? completely favorable for the plaintiffs in this regard, right? And then this will be plaintiffs in, in every state, because I'm sure you're going to have a precedent in this state, precedent in that state, and then that will allow them to actually win. Uh, every state might be different, right? But then... No, on the effects of that, I think a it'll it'll make it increasingly expensive 
to to supply energy, to move goods, to uh, transport yourself anywhere. It's going to impact the auto industry. It's going to impact a lot of different aspects of everybody's lives in that regard. Now, mind you, that in all likelihood, right, a lot of these oil companies would likely just uh, file for bankruptcy, continue operating. And I'm not sure how that will work under what particular like legal scheme, but they will find some kind of like bankruptcy relief and they'd eventually come, come up with some kind of settlement, right? But even then, right, it uh, as, as the everyday consumers, right, it'll impact consumers in that regard. So at that point, what do you think will happen to most of the attitudes of the impact of consumers against climate change activism versus oil companies, right? Uh, who are they going to resent more? Are they going to resent the oil companies or are they going to resent the uh, the planets trying to, tr and, and then at that point, you know, it may, it, it may bring about a reckoning as far as saying, okay, I, I, we've gone too far with this climate change activism, we're going in the wrong direction, or or do you may have an opportunist that comes up and says, "Well, listen, we're we're gonna we're gonna supply you with a type of um, cheaper electric car that you can that you can buy, which is you know tiny, the size of a the size of a Honda Fit, and that that's gonna be the the standard going forward." Right. You know, I um, is... I keep thinking of the um, of the uh, the legal side of medical malpractice mm -hmm. uh, in, in the context here. And that is, um, if you have a lot of plaintiffs' lawyers, and mm -hmm. they sue every doctor and right. uh, they get settlements out of every insurance company, the cost of medical care goes up. The cost of doctors mm -hmm. go up. Um, the cost of medical insurance goes clearly goes up. Um, the whole medical industry, and for that matter, health in this country and maybe other countries, is affected by it um, and, and you have to have huge reform to avoid that kind of, right now we pay more for health care than any other place mm -hmm. uh, and query whether we're getting the health care we're paying for um but but i think this is a parallel and um, so if we have to pay more uh, for oil uh, for electricity um whatever the case then um that you know that is going to affect everything everything, everything imagine and so, for example, you know, the, the general rule, see if you agree with me, <laughs> excuse me, the general rule is that an economy which has plentiful, bountiful and cheap energy is a healthier, better economy. Mm -hmm. An economy which has trouble getting energy is an economy under pressure and it won't be as, 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 as strong. Right. Um, so if that's the case, and we wind up paying more for energy because of this this wave of lawsuits, if you will. Um, that's going to affect the economy. Am I right? Absolutely, absolutely. Now I'm going to throw something at you that's going to even not really ha hang out of your seat, right? Because now I'm concerned. Who do you think is really? I mean, where and what court system in the free world? And I did say free world. Do you think these cases will have any kind of merit or any kind of attention? Mm. Right. Yeah. So so do you think other countries like China or even India or or Russia or some parts of Africa, some parts of Latin America, are they going to even care? Are they, are, are they even going to claim there's any jurisdiction going on? A. B. Are they going to then potentially nationalize a lot of these abandoned assets? Because these oil companies can no longer afford it as a result of these oil, oil um, lawsuits. They're going to abandon those assets, or maybe, uh, or, or maybe outsource, for example, the operation of these assets to these nations, and they'll continue operating, right? So then now they're going to, they'll be free to double down and do what they want. So, and all these countries, basically, for every, for, again, for every fossil fuel plant we shut down, they open up four or six, and that's so tie that to national security. So if we're at a point where we're vulnerable, we're vulnerable now. Right. And 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 we're, we're we're with all these like the way these renewables are being handled and the way that we're approaching the renewables need, the way we have, for example, this new deeper duck curve and how we're, we're responding to to grid fluctuations right? with these inverter based resources. You know, we're, we're edging closer and closer to a capacity issue and we're edging closer and closer to a, to a grid instability issue, which puts us at greater risk of having not just one blackout, but several blackouts. Right. So. Now add 
add this to the mix, and we're we're fixing to get ourselves into a really serious problem when it comes to energy security. And energy security, of course, you know, is tantamount to national security. So that's another problem we we, we could see, right? And, and and would Congress get involved at this point? We're saying, listen, this is a national security issue. It's it's all bets are off, and that's something you might see. Yeah, I know that's the other side of the coin. Let's say the Supreme Court gets this, takes this, mm -hmm. and says this is not a matter for the states. This is national or international implications. We're right. going to rule on it. And then they rule on it and say, I'm sorry, we have no jurisdiction. The, the Leonard Leo approach, uh, which, which favors the oil companies, that's what the oil companies want. Um, they, so the Supreme Court says, I'm sorry, this isn't our wheelhouse. So you have to go to Congress. OK, and Congress isn't going to do anything because Congress is, you know, the the object of so much lobbying, especially lobbying by the oil companies. And it's just, you know, there are some who in Congress will want to see some action taken, but there are many, perhaps the majority, consistently over time. And that depends on how the elections go in November, who don't want to do anything, uh, who, who want to favor the status quo and the existing market market power of the oil companies. Mm -hmm. So let's assume for a moment, maybe you you've already addressed this, that nothing happens, you know, That's status true. quo all mm -hmm. the way. Uh, these lawsuits at the state level cannot proceed. Uh, they cannot proceed in the federal courts. Um, and, and the only place they can happen is in Congress, which is locked up tighter than a drum, not an oil drum, just a regular drum. Uh, and so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> so. My, I guess my question is, you know, how does that affect things? That it seems to me that leaves us um, vulnerable to the mm -hmm. same vulnerabilities that we have now, and it's more of a climate change question I put to you. If, right. if that is if that is the case, what happens? Right, and well, the environment the environmental problem is still there, right? It, it's 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 now it's going to be a shift or 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 a refocus on the approach. Now, granted, it's it is one thing I've noticed is that is that Congress does not write great legislation. That was one thing I've seen over and over again. It, you know, it's it just humans writing laws of, on things they are not experts on. Time and time, and that's one thing I've, I've learned. A painful lesson I've learned: they're writing laws on things they're not they're not they are not SMEs on. So the same thing will happen here. And they're listening. They're going to committees. They're listening to different proposals. They're inviting experts. And this is likely, I think, we'll see some kind of legislation passed. And however, this will open the door, I believe, to some discoveries or so, because there is research. There was research done. There is information out there that they themselves conducted. They did run studies, which they 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 quickly kind of like you know locked away and made sure nobody saw. You know, so the point of this lawsuit really is the fact that they were they, they were deliberately. Um, causing harm by by misleading the public, right, and, and and suppressing this information that they themselves had. So, is it true? Well, that's what they're claiming. Do it, would I like to see that? Yes, I would really much like to see all that data. I would love to see that data, and I, and I would like to see. Well, I mean, this data going back from the 1950s and 60s, right? Something else in the 70s, something else in the 80s, and then at that point, things kind of like you know quieted down, and things began moving forward and, and status quo. But but at one point, right, that there, there's a lot of information, especially when they had the Clean Air Act, right, um, many decades ago, probably before. I, I think it was in the 70s or 80s. I think, I think it was in the 70s when they had the Clean Air Act. And at that point, a lot of a lot of data was was available, right, specifically with big oil and fossil fuel burning. So, in effect, right, we may see we may see a a, a Clean Air Act two come out of that potentially, and I, and that's something I'll be really curious to see. I think in that regard, um, on my industry side, I think that will potentially, you know, uh, I think most utilities are source agnostic. They don't care where the power comes from as long as they get good, reliable, cheap power. If it's clean, great. If you're not a generator owner, generator operator, you don't care. You just want to make sure that the at the other end of the line, the power is coming in and you're able to supply your customers. That's all you care about. If you're a generator owner, then you care you care a little more, right? So at that point, I think that they'll be looking at hedging hedging their risks, and maybe uh, supporting or pressuring the the development of newer technologies, right? 
and whether it's batteries, whether it's solar, uh, but in my opinion, I think it's going to be nuclear, and they're going to emphasize put more emphasis on that. I think there were there will be shift and refocus investments. Uh, I think with the uh, with the Build Back Better plan, they had a couple of billion for for nuclear, and then hundreds of billions for wind. And I think that 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 really is 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 recent. That's an example of how people that aren't really experts are de deciding where the resources should go. This could uh, incentivize uh, non-fossil fuel sources because right. you can't you can't file a lawsuit, um, you know, against a wind company at least not for this, and uh, for that matter, a solar company. But um, you know, I suggest that right now. Um, in our current um, political and geopolitical environment, um, uh, green energy, clean energy has been, to a certain degree, politicized. Yeah, uh, been I, and I find uh, the press is largely lacking on making this point. Um, and I find that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation coming from, you know, political agendas that try to make people under, make people believe that uh, there is no climate change right um and so i, I think this particular case if, if it if the supreme court should rule um in, you know in favor of these lawsuits at the state level we are going to see that level of polit politicization increase mm -hmm. dramatically and the level of um, misinformation and disinformation increase because people are people in the oil side of it they're going to want um to convince the electorate that mm -hmm. there is no climate change or that it's not serious and there's nothing we can do about it all those things the it's going to get white hot if that happens in fact it might get white hot either way well, I, i'm thinking it, it's 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 I think the animals left the barn already at that point because pretty much everybody sees, understands, and especially if you're somebody who goes out to the outdoors quite a bit, like myself, and I myself being in the outdoors a lot in several states, I can tell you that I've seen the climate change over the last many decades. Right? I, I I've been I've been a, a, an outdoorsman for forty something years, and I can tell you things have changed. Uh, and, and so so that that I think it's rather than than that accelerating the the the, the notion to, to deny the effect on, on climate, I think what you're going to see is instead of, instead of that approach, I think what you'll see is the approach of yes, we agree with you, but we can't make this change like this so drastic so soon. Give us time. And what they'll do is that give us time uh request will take a long time. And what'll happen is and that'll be done under the notion of national security. You know, something you raised, I think it's worth pursuing a little bit. It's just a nuclear option. Mm -hmm. You know, they had nuclear reactors in various places around the world. I mean, France, for example, has tons of nuclear reactors, and, and it works well for France. Uh, there are other places, too, in Europe and elsewhere where there are nuclear reactors. It doesn't uh, work so well in Fukushima, but hey, they can probably correct those problems going forward. Better designs and that sort of thing. So, that, you know, to me, I think the nuclear option becomes more interesting, maybe more appealing as we go forward because uh, and you know better in terms of the cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. seems to me that although building a nuclear reactor is an expensive proposition um the amount of energy you get from it is huge and may be worth the effort and of course there there are political you know there are political considerations and a lot of places do not want to have nuclear in their backyard but the fact is that the technology, I think we've talked about this before, the technology may be able to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And so where does it stand? I mean, do you think that nuclear has a better chance uh, politically and technologically of succeeding when we find we really can't use so much oil, um, that we uh, that the, oil, the cost of oil is too much, and that um, nuclear presents itself an, as an option we, we should consider? Uh, as far as small modular reactors, one of the biggest hurdles that we're, we're seeing as an industry and as a nation, perhaps, is that first, we, we have to catch up with China. We're behind. And the other challenge we're seeing is that um, we cannot agree on one design. So if we can agree on one design for these small modular reactors, we can then mass produce them and build many of the same design. If that's the case, then the economies of scale will kick in and it'll become really affordable. 
you can make one type of fuel, you can make one type of vessel, you can make this this device over and over again. And and it's just, it's basically like having modular batteries, right? Uh, when it comes to like, like, like source and, and capacity. Um, I think the design right now that the National Renewable Energy Labs is working on is one that's like a salt, a molten salt reactor, which is considered a lot safer than everything else. And it's it, it, it's just a few years away. Uh, there's another company, I believe it's Dutch or Swedish, where they have reactors on barges. And, that's, and, and, and those, the, the kind of fuel there is a little different, right? And then you have, of course, the the uh, the uh, naval reactors, which you see already in most uh, U.S. Navy. I mean, they, there's some reactors already in, in, in Hawaii, right? They're sitting there on boats. So, so that ship has sailed. But you know, as far as putting them on, on the ground, right, to supply energy and supply the grid, uh, what's the difference between having them on a boat from the Navy or having them on the ground, which you can then remove at any given time, which because they're small enough to do that. But so, so I think once we once we figure out um, a good design that's repeatable, uh, because because the first one's expensive, the second one's half as expensive, the third one is one fourth as expensive, and then so on and so forth, right? You, you have the whole. Uh, geometric regression of the price of that particular reactor. And then getting the fuel, refining it. I mean, France had its own close call, I think a couple of years ago, uh, with those four countries in Africa that decided to ally themselves against it because of the fact that that's where they got most of their raw uranium from. So, you know, that that, that changes the political dynamic in some of these countries where they, they, they took back control of their natural resources. The new paradigm that, that is likely to happen in that circumstance is probably going to help the uh, the global south. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many places in Africa, Latin America, they do not have adequate uh, energy. Right. And um, if, if there were these modular reactors, um, places that have never been able to light up a light bulb uh, until now could, could have energy. And that would really be a good thing for them. Well, it's not just that. It's now they can, now they can power industrial industrial endeavors. Yeah. And that's that. That's where the other thing happens because in some of these cases, you might have a mine, right? You might have a, a place that's been geologically surveyed and it has resources, but it's just too expensive to bring all their infrastructure there to mine that that particular material. But so with this particular technology, it, it may be possible to go and extract that at a lower price. And along with that, now you build communities, you build infrastructure, you build industry around that area, or you supplement. For example, a smaller town becomes a, now a bigger city with a lot more prosperity. So a lot of opportunities exist regarding that particular energy source. It's just a matter of you know, finally agreeing and settling on one design and moving forward with that, I think. Okay, so I only have one more question for you, Guillermo. Hmm. <clears throat> I know, you know you're know you not a lawyer, and uh, I'm certainly not an energy lawyer, uh, but together we can at least ask a lot of legal questions. Yeah. So my question to you is, um, I put you in front of the Supreme Court. Okay. And As a Supreme witness, Court, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to them about energy policy? What do you say to them about, um, you know, and, and try to extract all the politics just for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to them about the position they should take on this question of allowing state lawsuits or stopping state lawsuits and putting it in Congress where nothing will happen? Uh, what do you say to them about how whether this is an inflection point, not only for the U.S., but elsewhere, and this is an inflection point that will affect all of us? I know this is a hard question. What yeah. do you say to them? Well, you got to remember, it's a bunch of people that are not experts at it, at anything other than law to make a decision of something that will impact everybody in the world, right? And... And really, it's a matter of simplifying the problem to the point of like you need to weigh. A, do you have the jurisdiction to actually to actually preside on this case? If not, you, you need to kick it down to the lower courts, right? But really, that's just passing the buck. Uh, ultimately, it's a matter of weighing the interest of one side versus the interest of the other, and then looking at the, at the overall good. But that that also gets into another problem because the the courts are there just to like apply the law not make laws, they're there to interpret and apply the law. So ultimately what they'll say is they'll probably kick it back to Congress in that regard, right? Say, well, we need to enforce what the EPA, what the what the different environmental laws say, and this is what you're gonna follow. If you don't like that, then go make changes in your, uh, in you know, at, at the legislative level. 
And that's probably what went up. And that's and my 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 opinion on that would, would be well, it's 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 remember the consequences of, of your of your judgment in this case, right? Because it's both sides will make compelling arguments, I'm sure. One side probably more more emotional than the other. I don't, I don't know which, but definitely both sides will make make really good arguments. And to ask a bunch of judges to to, to preside on something that they're, they're not experts in is a really tough call in this regard. So I, I really believe this they should really be left up to the, the legislative. But at the same time, it, it's also looking at the consequences of, of the realism of what they're suing for, right? Because you know, what are they? What sort of damages are they trying to recover? And that's what, what my, the question I would ask in that regard. I don't know if I answered your question, but it is a tough question to answer. <laughs> that what I get out of it. I get out of it is that we have to respect the experts. Mm -hmm. We have to retain the experts, you know, in the government, and the administration, um, experts who can answer these questions, who can give us advice, and who can give advice to Congress. Right. And for Congress, we have to make sure that everybody who runs for Congress has two platform points that they tell us their positions on. Number yeah. one is climate change and environment. Um, and the other is energy. We have yeah. to hear from them about what they plan for energy. It's energy, energy reliability, energy security, right? But, and, and then, like, of course, weighing that, you know, hand in hand with, with climate. I mean, you, you, you just can't do one or ignore the other. You, you have to balance both of those together. And I think, are you able... The litmus test is, are you able to balance both of these interests and, and, and come up with a desirable outcome? And you're not going to make everybody happy, but you can have an outcome that impacts impacts the most amount of people positively or at least minimizes the, the negative impact on everybody else. It's a tough one. Well, Guillermo, this has been a great conversation. We've covered so many issues. I didn't think we'd cover all these issues <laughs> in one talk show, but but we will we will cover them again. We will follow them. We we'll follow this uh, trail where it leads. Thank you so much, Guillermo Sabache. HSI.com. So thank you again, Jay, for having me back on your show. It's always a pleasure. And uh, anytime you want to have me back here once once again, I'd be more than happy to join. Mm -hmm.